Well, hello and good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the latest in our webinar series. This time we are focusing on digital skills, and it's been a big, big week for digital skills in social care. We'll get to discuss that. Uh, as usual, um, those of you who are uh, repeat uh, joiners of our webinars will know that I'll just be addressing a few uh, practical points and points of business uh, before we pile straight on to our discussion. So uh, number one, all views expressed by our lovely panelists who will be introducing themselves very shortly are, are their own. Um, we strongly encourage you to get as involved as you would like to get. Uh, we have the chat, uh, we have the chat open. Um, you have a separate tab at the bottom to answer, uh, ask your questions and we'll get to as many questions as we possibly can during uh, the length of the, of the webinar. Um, and we'll run for around 50 minutes and then my colleague Hemel will be joining us. And if you're interested in hearing or seeing a little bit more about what we do here at Sona, he'll be giving a whistle-stop run-through of that uh, then, and we'll be happy to take any questions you have uh, on that as, as well. Um, so this session is also being recorded. That's a common question that we get. So uh, it could be, it will be available within sort of 24 hours and uh, you're welcome to uh, yeah, tune back in or, or if there's someone you think could benefit from seeing this session, uh, send it on to them. That will all be in the in the follow up materials. And then finally, a special announcement. So we are doing our first ever urgent Q and A as a bonus webinar tomorrow morning at nine thirty. Um, there is an additional grant for um, uh, for adult social care technology. I believe this came up uh, quite a lot in the skills for care webinar yesterday. Every part part of that and. It applies to quite a wide range of, of technologies and support services for uh, social care, but the deadline is super close. It uh, closes next week on Friday, and happily we have uh, Geraint uh, Thomas, uh, who's Director of uh, Guided Innovation and expert in digital implementation in the sector. Um, he's going to join me for a quick Q&A, sort of half an hour, to go through that application process and answer any questions that you have. So. The link to that is being posted by Holly in the uh, in the chat now. If you would like to join us for that, and uh, and uh, further details will follow. So that's all the uh, points of business that I have, and now I will happily pass on to our panelists. And if you'd like to just uh, uh, do a quick intro for yourselves, um, starting with you, Lou. Hi, I'm Lou Launchbury. I work at Active Prospects. We're a care provider based in Surrey and I'm the care systems manager there. So I look after all of our digital tech for our support staff. Super, I'll take it from here. Uh, I'm Oli Johnson. I'm founder of Sona, who I hope you know uh, is the operating system for the frontline workforce in social care. Uh, my job is to work with our prospective, but also our current customers to make sure that they are productive uh, while using our products. I'm the uh, commercial director at Camascope. So we digitize the medication record in a number of different care settings. So care homes, supported living and in the community and in the community. So we're, we're an email supplier. Um, my name is Silly Torres. I joined the care sector when I was 18 and still in full time education. But a week now today, I joined an amazing company called Guided Innovation. That's great. Thanks, for, thanks a lot, everyone. Looking forward to getting into this discussion. So, um, uh, Lou, I'm going to start with you. Um, I think probably a, a starting point when it comes to this discussion and uh, the, the title is um, do, do we need an, uh, an upgrade? I think there's quite a lot of stats that s say that, yes, we do, because there's both the need for it and also um, the desire for uh, in terms of the, the workforce to um, to uh, to improve their knowledge in the area. But obviously, before we can do that, before we can provide the support that they need, we need to sort of understand where people's levels are at. So how do you think uh, providers can sort of effectively assess the, the training needs of their of their workforces in this area? So I know that um, at Active Prospects, when we have people starting with us um, during their induction, we've actually learned over the last 
two or three years that we need to get staff to log in and show what you know to show almost show us their competency um to log into emails log into the training system our hr system just to make sure that the training manager knows that when this person leaves them that there are they are going to be able to do um a few things digitally and obviously in the last two years, we've had our DSCR as well, so that they do give them a, an overview of that, so that they know when they go in that they are going to be expected to be working digitally as well. Um, I'm always in close contact with our training team, and they will give me the heads up if they think I'm going to need to go and head into a service, just to give that little bit of extra support and talk people through, um, you know, getting into their emails or, or things. I know recently we had we've brought in a, a new um training system again an e another a new e-learning system um and it's been so <laughs> quite hard because we had to make sure people are going to their emails to get the to get the links to log in and the people aren't logging in because they just can't get to their emails because it's not simple so as well as people being able to do it the systems in themselves need to be simpler to do that Oh, that's you know it's definitely yeah it, it's definitely you you need to get people on with you to see how they're going and what they need oh, yeah okay i think um one of the key points that came out from um the webinar yesterday uh, that i took away is like um just basic digital access as well like uh, i think that's kind of aligned to what you said said lou it's like um uh, and I'd be interested, uh, maybe um, uh, for, for the rest of the panel to chime in on this. Um, the you know technology can help, as, like with learning management systems, but also just access to information. Technology can help with learning about about technology, right? And mm -hmm. I, I think that's like a, a, also a fundamental principle: is that if you don't know how people are interacting with technology every day, and and they don't have the ability to try and test it out it's very difficult to understand what they're comfortable with and what they need more more help with right yeah i guess if, if you are if you're an employer and you you have staff that you know you, you already you have a good idea about what they should be doing on a day-to-day -day basis and what tools they should be using and therefore what their competency should be on those tools and then separate and that, that's why you would i guess build uh, a curriculum if you like about you know how to kind of get mm -hmm. them to that level but that doesn't necessarily capture mm -hmm. the stuff that you don't know uh, about their kind of previous experience with technology and stuff like that. And so like allowing them to like peppering throughout their journey with your company, not just like at the start of their journey, but like throughout like ability to, you know, mm -hmm. request more information or, or, you know, even just like within in application suppliers should really have uh, a way to kind of ask for help either from from the suppliers themselves or from, from people within the organization uh, that can help uh, to train on those things, I think. Yeah, I, I kind of agree with that because I think it's it's really important that um, that staff know where to look. And yeah. I think that can often be like a, a knowledge gap that is um, kind of misunderstood sometimes because, you know, you can't necessarily always Google things. You can't necessarily uh, assume people know exactly where the help guides are, exactly where the support, the, where the support guides are where the guided help is it's up to the suppliers to make this really really simple so it's 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 intuitive for for users and uh, i think that's i think that's really really important yeah so the, um how does that chime with your experience of of work of like joining and being onboarded and 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 uh, and working for a care provider um, well, we know our you know, average workforce of the care sector is 44 with like 27, I think, being over 55. So we know they're used to paper based items and we know they don't like change. So I think for me, working in care, um, you have to talk to your staff. Um, you know, how do they feel about technology? You can, you know, conduct them surveys, gather the feedback, monitor the staff of, you know, where they are with the tech and, you um, when they find things challenging, you can always add additional training uh, to target them challenges to help them. Yeah. Actually, one thing to add there, I just like uh, when you said the uh, the makeup of the, the the sector. It just like one thing that resonated massively with me is that you know there are there will be just differences in terms of kind of how uh, 
how digitally native you are going to be, right? I just yeah. remember like when I went uh, in, in college, they, they made us do like this typing course, right? Like you have to kind of learn how to type on, on a keyboard. Um, and uh, what would have been a very nice experience, I think, is for just at the start of the course, maybe give people a typing test or something like that to, to kind of check proficiency on that typing thing. Because I remember being pretty proficient in typing and then being subjected to a year of literally typing out, you know, a, 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 B, 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 C, C, C. And it's just like, if you think about the, the like, you know, level of engagement at that point for myself was pretty, pretty low, I think. And I think like you'll have similar things going on in different, different uh, organizations if you try to supply this kind of one size fits, fits all. Like that just won't happen. People will have different, different digitally kind of native backgrounds, I think. Yeah. Yeah. I was going to say a lot of people previously worked in care because they weren't good at using a computer because going into care you didn't need to have a, you know computer skills you didn't need to know how to do any of that because you're using a pen and paper now um and, you know as again i've i've kind of, where i've grown up i'm i'm around the, i know i'm around the same age as ollie um and <laughs> I kind of i grew up without an internet you know i'm ollie and i are going to be both older than the actual internet as well and it means that we've actually had, you know, we've we've sort of grown into into the digital world, um, but those that obviously were working before us still find, you know, did find it a lot harder. When I when we transitioned onto our DSCR, it was a lot of the older staff that really really struggled, and they were like, I can't use it, I, I don't know how to use it, and I'm like, it is an app, you know, you you if you can use an app on your phone, if you have a smartphone. Um, and you can use an app you can use the system and you know I did train them on it but the fact is it's it is scary you know a lot of things have changed and that's you know in the last 40 years it's it's an incredible amount of change and you know and, and we're seeing things even since last November when AI came out you know it's it's even it's literally just going crazy yeah I think and, and to the point about kind of typing I think that it's it's really important to appreciate that when you're transitioning from paper to digital system that um if you don't get this right if people aren't kind of um confident in using technology then you might actually reduce the quality of note taking and that's not what we want to do when we move um, people over from uh, a paper-based system to digital so i think that again you know what we as suppliers can do is 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 to make that simpler and and obviously work with providers to ensure that um you know that people are more confident but you know uh, features like speech to text actually we found uh, within our within, within our email system that um, just adding that just one button where you can kind of speak that that really enriched the quality of the note taking mm -hmm. and I think that the, the is that's that's really really important because I don't know whether any of you have ever tried typing on like a tablet as an example it just yeah. feels like you know really different to a phone where you, you know using your thumbs and everything is just like you know pointing down pointing down and it just takes you know it's quite frustrating from a user experience perspective. I will say, actually, our system does have speech to text. And throughout that training process, when I get to the point of like, this is where you put the notes in, and then I go, mm -hmm. and if you press this little button here, then you can speak it, and the, their faces are just like, wow, oh my god, that's going <laughs> to make my life so much quicker. You know? <laughs> I don't have to type shepherd's pie and cottage, you know, and all this, you know, and they yeah. can just speak it like, you know, I don't have, they don't have to worry about how they spell Weetabix. I mean, I don't care how it's written. You know, we understand what it says. Other cereals are available, um, but it just makes their life just so much more easier to do. And you know, as long as as long as developers and providers understand that you know it's you kind of have to cater to everyone you've got people who are dyslexic as well who worry about their typing even the autocorrect um option doesn't always autocorrect to what you want it to so mm. see the words chicken um substitute for the word children someone's eating children today um, <laughs> you know. um so it doesn't always get it right but it's better it's much better than trying to, again trying to read somebody's handwriting yeah so, yeah um yeah definitely i think my wife's biggest uh like uh, kind of pet peeve with technology is watching me type on a mobile phone she just like she she looks at it and just thinks like how can you be this slow at typing on anything <laughs> um so there, there, there's different levels there's levels there's levels uh, to mm -hmm. can i just and, say uh, and, and the girls asked a question sorry amen were you going to so. Uh, no, you please go ahead. I was going to follow up with a question, but if there's a question to um, uh, to, to answer, That's then please fine. go for it. 
So it says, how does it work for whom English isn't their native language? Obviously, if it's in, if you're speaking in English, even if it's not your native language, it the speech to text that's on our system picks up lots of different um, accents. We have a lot of European staff, we have a lot of African staff working with us, and it does pick up their accents um, and and it does translate it into English. Well, you know, the grammar is not perfect, but then again, mine, mine always isn't so good either. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah just thought i'd answer that question that I, yeah, I feel like that has also just improved a lot over even like the, the last year or so like me talking to siri uh on my like <laughs> remote like trying to turn on like a uh, different channel or whatever on on my apple tv didn't really work a year ago it's working a lot better now and so <laughs> yeah, i'm not sure i'm not sure my mine like sometimes mine doesn't like me it just ignores me that's great. Uh, thanks. Thank you for the question. And also for thank you, Lou, for jumping on on the question straight away. You're making my job easier. Um, so <laughs> uh, we've we talked a little bit about sort of um, like different areas of what people are required to do. Um, perhaps one again for you to lead us off on. Lou, do you do you think there's a, like a common sort of two to three or however many um gaps in in knowledge that you you often you often come across and and how do you uh, what, what have you got in place and how do you think about um like making sure that um those those are covered off um in, within uh, active prospects so i missed the, I, I kind of forgot the beginning of that sorry <laughs> uh, do you see do you see any regular or very common like gaps in digital skills knowledge, knowledge? are there things that it, it just they pop up time and time again um the gaps are i mean digital i mean people are just scared of using a new app you know generally that's where it, it's something when it, when it, you're introducing something new it's the unknown it's the fear of the unknown um the issues that we normally find are i mean the, the issues are passwords usernames passwords those are the things that people struggle with the most i would say you know i could give them any kind of digital system and worry not worry about and teach them in it but it's getting them in the system in the first place um I mean, and the worst, I mean, to be fair, the digital, I find the most, it's a digital skill, it's etiquette, is the email system. So you give everybody email and that reply all button. I mean, I'm sure mm. I'm not the only person that you find, you send an email out and, and then you get a reply all to everyone. And it's like, please, please don't. I mean, we've had to limit... Um, our all company emails, we've, there's only certain people that can send them now because the fact that you had support staff sending reply all or they're sending a whole group email about something personal to, to the wrong group. So um, I think a lot of the skills that are missing are just, I'm going to have to say it, partly common sense. Um, mm -hmm. so, so you just have to you know guide people along. They, pick, they do pick it up. They do learn. I had people threatening to leave when we put a dscr in they're all still working with us and they love the system so you just have to you kind of in, being encouraging helps people to learn as well yeah. i think there's a massive lack of awareness of the benefits that tech um can bring like in some cases you get care homes implement technology and they don't even end up using it because they don't know how i think that's a, that's a big one yeah yeah that you can put um like a a laptop into a system uh, um, to a service and say well you can all go and check your email on the laptop yeah. that's great but until you actually go well this is how you do it it's mm. just a bit of computer sitting in the corner mm -hmm. um and i think that's where a lot of the staff you know you 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 know when we when we i'm guessing well you you sit and use a computer quite often so we're always logging in and it's very second nature but when you're a care staff uh, member and you're doing that most of the day coming to the computer and going well, okay well I need to sit down and go into checking email mode how do I get in the computer that is literally the sort of almost the basic um, we do I mean we do try and help our staff and each service has their own like logins and it's all sort of there in the office for them to do but they still that, that's that's a kind of like the big thing that is still scary for some staff to sit on a laptop yeah. yeah, and I guess if you're also familiar with a different type of 
kind of operating system that you're that you're using so if you're used to using your iphone and then you're given uh, an android app it's like it's very like, it can feel very foreign navigating around that and you know where the where are the settings where is everything i want to get out how do i do that and i think that if you start training from uh you know uh from from not you know where the app is you know and assume that everyone kind of understands how to turn things off or change the volume then it's is i think and then you can get issues where people get frustrated because it's like the system's not working for them yeah yeah they have a lot of um like the nhs gave us ipads during lockdown um to help people communicate with their families and then obviously i've gone in there with android tablets to run our system on and even some of the managers are like, oh, I don't want to use Android because I use iPhone. And I'm like, guys, you know, it's you know, it's not too scary. To be fair, though, when I pick up an iPhone or anything now, I'm kind of bamboozled by it because I've been Android for ages. <laughs> so yeah, actually, you exactly right. That was a, that was a note that I'd made at some point. It's the you do get people going, oh my god, I can't use it because it's on the wrong operating system that I'm not familiar with. Mm-hmm. Um, and as long as you're familiar with them, it's quite easy to, you know nurture them i'm gonna say nurture them to do it the way you want to oh amen i think you're on mute can we hop to another question that's just um that's just come in um uh this is this is around i i uh, and again this is a recurring theme and i'm I'm glad it's been addressed in in terms of sort of like uh what's been called like kind of digital apprehension or, or or fear uh, perhaps uh, again directed uh, first of all at you, Lou, as, uh, as as the provider in the group, but um, perhaps something that um, others can touch on as well. Um, have you found that the type of device use has impacted the perception or adoption um, amongst colleagues? So I, I guess that's um, you know it, it, whether it's a familiar or unfamiliar device, like we've talked about tablet tablets, for example, um, and and you know if if it's like. If it's got, if it's familiar with something that they use in their, say, home life versus being very specific medical or or um, or support device. Yeah, they, bringing in the Android devices was one of those things that you've got. Some people um, were just like straight away, they're like, oh, wow, it's just a big version of my phone. So that was the Android users. And then you've got other people like, but they're like really wary of using it. But they've, but it's just, I'm literally just like, just unlock it. You know, this is how you unlock it. And then there's, a, you know, I put the apps on the home screen. So it's just easy for them to get into it. So I was like, you don't need to do anything but use it for that. Um, and it's, um, it definitely, you know, it did sort of make people a little bit wary. Um, and I'm, but, you know, the Android, I think, I mean, the ideally, yeah, we'd love to have iPads. I mean, that's mm. just hands down because it is just better. It's less, you know, less likely to corruption. But the cost of it. You know, uh, we are funded by the local authority. You know, unfortunately, we're not a private company. So, you know, we don't have, you know, we're not we're a not-for-profit organisation. So, so we don't have stacks of money sitting out the back of what we've charged people. You know, what, you know, what, come, what we get in goes out. So there's not a lot of money there to sit and play with. Um, and I did see somebody was talking about the, um, the funding for them. The funding, you know, that is available. Sorry, I'm jumping to something else. Sorry, Eamon. Um, for the ICSs as well, the um, I'm involved in one of those in Surrey, and they are they, you know, the money's there to start it. But obviously, yes, yeah, you do have to carry on, and obviously, that is a cost that you have to look at and go, okay, we're going to have to bear that cost because every company is going to have to. Um, yeah. But the money is there to start you getting that tech, you know, start getting that tech in and get it get it used. But I think. Mate, as long as you provide the training to people and you're patient with them um, and then they, they can come to you, then I wouldn't worry about bringing in new devices to people. It's just. Yeah. I'm not suggesting you, you go ahead and, and just like uh, furnish uh, you know, your businesses with, with, with iOS devices. They are more expensive. Mm. But like, it is one of those things, though, that I find that it's interesting to weigh up the cost of. Um, you know, an upfront cost of an IS device versus like a, a tablet that is like uh, not just like it's, it's unfair to compare like iOS and Android just in that way. Android is a, a myriad of things, but like if you get a very cheap Android tablet, then, then you're surprised that people don't want to use it when it takes like you know five seconds to, to power up and every single thing you do on it takes you know between five and ten seconds. That strikes me as a, a wrong prioritization. And like if you, if there's belief in in that 
digital, um, you know, drives benefits mm. in the organization, be it, you know, uh, more efficiency or better experiences, then there, there should be a level below which a digital experience doesn't fall below. That doesn't mean iOS, but it means certainly more than, mm. you know, a device that takes five or 10 seconds to, to, to operate on every single time you turn it on. So. And I guess from uh, from a transformation standpoint, if people are frustrated with the device, that can kind of conflate into frustration mm -hmm. of the system that that you're trying to implement, and, exactly. uh, and then you can kind of uh, mix the you know blend the two up when actually you know it's a it's it's a it's a hardware issue. Um, yeah. So, yeah, yeah. I think I mean with within our services, obviously the devices that I put in were Android. But we did have one service where the Wi-Fi, you know, obviously it all yeah. depends on the exactly. Wi-Fi as well. And I've had this conversation <laughs> already. The Wi-Fi um, can also be a big issue with the devices. So, yeah, a good, a good system, a good Android device, you know, you, you should see next to no difference. Mm. But we did see a difference, quite a marked difference in one set. So we managed to find some older used um, iOS devices, put them in instead, and it runs almost yeah, the same as other services, you know. So we we are having to look at that. And I'm looking, I've got new services opening up and I'm actually thinking what is going to be better for them? You know, can I find some better tech? Because obviously, ultimately, it's we, we use it for one thing. We're looking to, you know, we're going to be using it for two or three other things um, coming up. So I need to make sort of something robust as well. Mm. It's going to take, you know, take working with those apps. So it's definitely... Um, yeah, the Wi-Fi as well. You know, it's all all um, you've, you've you've got to have a device with enough power to take that as well. Yeah, good. Cool. cool. Um, so I think that there's something that we've just started touching on, but um, I'm going to formalize it with a kind of a two part question, which is. Um, the the reply all thing in the in the email is 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 really interesting in terms of uh, yeah there's a certain element of like soft digital skills that are, are more about kind of um, the, not not reading the the training manual but but about sort of um, like generally accepted uh, codes of conduct when it comes to using uh, digital um, also mm -hmm. the the kind of like staying safe and uh, and using it in a se sensible manner. Uh, kind of aspects uh, aspects of that as well and then also from the other side you know like in the case of something like a reply all um, how we can build digital products that reduce the likelihood that um, accidental of accidental user behavior right because it's just not that easy to accidentally misuse uh, the product for what it was in, in, intended for. So perhaps I could hand over to um, our um, tech suppliers in the in, in in the in the panel to sort of talk about the uh, number one sort of how can how can sort of tech suppliers kind of maybe draw on the the work that some of the largest sort of consumer apps have been doing in terms of you know the, reducing the barrier to entry for certain te technologies and 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 making uh things intuitive uh, but also helping uh, <laughs> providers with the the support and the the learning how to to use it properly so that that doesn't necessarily fall complete completely on them and even some of the like learning of how to use technology better is perhaps even embedded in in the technology that they're using every day yeah Rob, do you want to start? I, I've had to take this as well. <laughs> I got a lot of. Yeah, things. I, I think that um, there's an awful lot that we can learn from kind of modern consumer um, uh, applications that everyone uses, and I think one of the one of the key things that you know we've all touched upon is that people consider themselves to be non-digital savvy, and often when we're confronted with that in one of our kind of training sessions, we we ask them if they use the likes of WhatsApp, if they use the likes of Facebook, because when you join, you don't get a big kind of manual. It, it is it is very in, intuitive and people can navigate their way around it and the notifications do kind of work into their workflow. And I think that from a supplier perspective, we have to pay really, really close detail to the workflow of the users and how they're using it. If you think about, you know, say Apple Pay, which is, um, or, or Samsung Pay or whatever you're, you're, you're using, when you go in, it's almost like using a credit card because it, it kind of blends into your workflow. And 
Um, if you're kind of delivering, uh, you know, care, care, um, care technology, it has to be um, able to mirror the workflow. So you're not making sure that people are kind of having to go off into their office or or into a breakout area and take their take their laptop and type in all of this stuff. It's it's at the point of care. Uh, and and uh, it's it, it's very um, integrated into the workflow of of, of users, and um, we uh, in order to get there, we'll we'll speak to users and have user groups, and I think that that's that's really really key because you you know developers can be very far removed from what was happening in in, in a care setting. Mm. So you have to have a kind of a layer where where uh, where where you've got people that are close mm. to that that can communicate back, and then that comes into product. So. Um, I, I think consumer tech is 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 incredible at, at this and making it uh, very very simple. Uh, you know, in terms of very complex things, become very very simple in in the user interface. And I think that that's something that all technology products in the, in, the, in the sector can learn from. Yeah, I I agree with everything that you said, Rob. Um, I think I think we think about this quite a bit at Sona. Like one one thing that we think about it is like how can you do. How can you present something in the with the least amount of information possible? And that can sometimes be daunting. But there is this, I think, like a seesaw that you have to be on, which is like the more um, the more choice you give someone, the more they can can uh, accidentally do something they weren't intending to do, right? And so you kind of have to balance the the kind of the power of giving them like all the choice uh, versus you know giving them less and having it maybe slightly less intuitive as a result of it. But you know, like they can only do a certain amount, and so you see this with like uh, consumer-grade products all the time. They like the amount that you could do on Twitter is 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 like has not increased massively over the years, right? Like it it like you can now retweet something, and back in the day, you used to do the oldies. We all remember you used to do like an RT type thing. You'd reply kind of and kind of like uh, type it in again and something like it's like that didn't really. Be a, like that is a, a function that they added much later, and so they're very careful about adding new functionality and trying to keep this as as, as kind of closely guarded as, as an experience, so that people get grow in confidence. And that kind of, kind of brings me on to the next point, which is like the user interfaces of some of these products. Like WhatsApp is is probably the the best example. Mm. You go into WhatsApp chat, you go into Instagram chat, you go into Twitter chat, you go into Telegram, Signal, whatever, maybe Messenger, like they are largely the same, right, from a user experience perspective. It doesn't mean that you can't innovate on communication. You can definitely innovate on communication and, mm -hmm. and, and permissions and stuff like that. But they are largely the same to kind of make it easy to kind of for us to, to kind of relate to. And I think that's super important because you don't have to reinvent the basics of these things all the time. You can still add tons of value mm -hmm. to a communications product, mm -hmm. but you don't have to do that through the user interface. And then a couple of other things that I just like throw into the mix, which is like when you go into all of these apps, you have time to value is like almost zero. Like you literally get to value immediately. And that's often what I see kind of as the big thing for um, the customers that we're talking to. Like we try to get their end user to value immediately. And that value is not the value for the business usually, it's the value for the end user. Um, in, in Sona's case, like an example would be um, a user being able to see their shifts or shifts available to them immediately in the app. That drives their engagement on the app. Mm -hmm. And as a result, they will be more engaged in the app and that will create yeah. benefits for the business. But it's, it doesn't start with the business. It, it starts with the end user getting immediate value. And I think, uh, I think we also seen uh, someone, uh, it was Trixie, I think that mentioned sandboxing and stuff like that. That's a very good, I think, method to allow people to play around with product without, you know, breaking their leg in any meaningful way. Like, so uh, they can actually not injure themselves while, while, while getting used to the technology. I think it's a great idea. Yeah, so in our system, um, our DSDR system, I have actually created a, um, I have a training mansion I created. So if I want to try new things, um, I've got a new form that I need to check out and make sure that it works properly, that it's going to read and report well. I will add it in there and I show, you know, put it in there just to make sure that I've got the setup right before I put it out to, for, you know, 100, 200 people to start to use. Um, because I don't want to, you know, it's, it's a care record. I don't want to make too many mistakes. I did start giving it to staff when they started, but then I have to keep going in and then changing the settings and it was just become too much of a headache. So I took that away. But it's good, to, yeah, we, we've created our own little area that we can do that in there. But obviously, one of the things you guys were saying about developing, um, it's one I was actually, I've made a note earlier of, of the fact that you need the real end users 
to be mm. testing it with you and saying, yeah, this is what we need. This is what we want. Um, because otherwise, you, yeah, you go off and make your product and think, oh, this is this is what it needs. And you, you use it and actually, no, it's not fit for purpose. Yeah. But also um, with um, my sister, so I use Sequoia and the admin side of it has got the, I say the best, um, <laughs> giving them all the heads up, a really good help section. I go in there and I want to do anything. I type in what it is I want to do. And it has this little little it's very intuitive and it takes me around the screen telling me how many steps it's going to take me to complete that task so i can go and set up a task or i can go and put a person in and it's literally goes click here and then it says do this and then click here but on the app side of it there's nothing like that for staff so if they get stuck hmm. they've then you know it would be great if they could press a little button and go okay i need to do this where do i go because i Otherwise, they've got to go and find a colleague, a manager, or phone me um, to find out what they've got to do. So, you know, I know some a lot of apps don't have help in them because mm. they are very intuitive, like WhatsApp, etc. But when you've got something a little bit more complicated, probably like an email system as well, you want to make yeah. sure that you're doing it. You are doing it right. So that's that could be an improvement to obviously not just you know for for all of these kind of products is to make sure that there is some kind of online help guide you know straight in the app that staff can use because i know that um there is a support website for for our product but yeah, you've got to come out of the app and you've got to go into that website to find the information so it'd just be much more easier if the staff could just get it from one screen and then yeah. not use where they yeah. were I, I, and I, th I think on that that's probably something where um technology used in the in the care sector needs to be different from consumer technology in that um i don't know whether any of you have ever tried to contact you know facebook support or instagram support <laughs> or any of this is you, you know you might have to fill out lots of forms and then you're, mm. you're taken to a knowledge base article and really what you need to do is speak to someone and i think that you know we're in uh you know the the the, the software of digitizing medication so if you've got a problem that could affect a medication round so you have to be able to get through to someone and you have to have a dedicated kind of yeah. um, um support team that can wrap around a, a client when they're when they're when they're struggling and obviously make sure that your knowledge center and your and your and your articles are, are strong but that yeah. you know should should they need to contact someone that that, that they're available it's so huge, Rob. I think like we talked about at the very start of this, Lou mentioned the reply all thing, and which is like a, a you know, it's it's a cultural thing, right? Like like uh, you, you might have intended to reply all, but maybe that wasn't appropriate, or you might have done it by accident because you, you know, didn't real, realize you were doing it. But like, that's a very small consequence compared to, you know, medication or something else that we're doing mm -hmm. like in care often and using technology specifically for in care. So like, Th that has to be built um the thinking about how to get people digitally native and kind of smart uh on the products that we're using in care the the, the bar or the hurdle that you have to clear is much much higher than you'd, you'd otherwise mm -hmm. kind of clear in kind of you know in netflix or something similar like netflix yeah. it can be relatively yeah. low yeah so. you can be a beginner netflix user when you when you buy your netflix account but mm -hmm. you know just make sure that you're you're pretty yeah. strong when it when it's around you know technology in the in the care sector <laughs> Yeah, exactly. <laughs> oh, uh, while we've got that, while we've sort of reached a natural uh, pause, just to let everyone know, um, we're interested in sort of um, how knowledge sharing is going on in your organization. So we've got a poll uh, running on that at the moment. So if you want to drop a drop a reply in that, that would be uh, that would be great. Um, and we'll share results at, at the end. Um, I would like to kind of draw on our last sort of 10 minutes together to sort of, obviously we've talked quite a lot about how tech is making this learning curve sort of like um, less, less dramatic, uh, but there's clearly still needs for like formal, tra formal training, informal training, knowledge sharing, um, all these things to, uh, to upskill people. Um, and uh, I'd like to sort of discuss two parts of that. So, Number one, there's recent research that uh, from employers saying that they still don't believe that um, people are coming out of school with the sufficient digital skills that they need. And I think there's danger that we just assume that like people coming out of school now at what, or university at whatever stage um, uh, are just digital natives and they know how to do all this stuff because they grew up with mobile phones and the internet. 
but obviously there's a big difference between knowing how to you know log into and use netflix and you know creating creating like a spread a spreadsheet with um with like uh, automation for example um so sadie perhaps you would like to touch on where you like feel there's maybe room for improvement in the education uh, system or, or like in in terms of government support for yes, yeah. uh, improving people's digital skills and then uh, like obviously not everyone's going to have huge pockets of money to give staff expensive training programs so what are some uh, low cost ways uh, or, or uh, sort of maybe hacky ways that um, we can facilitate better digital skills and increase digital confidence in the social care workforce um, so Gen Z have grown up with tech all around us you know we, we're growing um, when growing you go through two important stages in your life and they're primary and secondary socialization and because we have been surrounded by tech and basically being born into a digital world our mindsets are kind of and mindset values and you know attitudes are a little bit different from you know the generation before us you know we do expect to be integrated tech to be integrated into our daily lives like personal and work life you know yes our generation is tech savvy um, we do know how to make things simpler for us however I, I do believe that you know my generation have a tough time actually adjusting to job related technology you know snapchat tiktok instagram we have that down to a t but we don't just drop up like go onto an excel and you know go crazy on it because what's the fun in that we don't you know jump on teams to call our friends and family we have you know facetimes on our mobile phones um the education system doesn't really set us up for what tech is actually like in the real world you know it's completely different to social media and what we're used to on our mobile phones so i would say if i was still in school i would like to have probably lessons um or activities after school to actually teach us um, the importance of tech and how to use it properly when in the workplace. And especially if you're going into places like social care, you know, you you can't use Snapchat in, in social care. That, it's not going to do any good. I, I think it's interesting that like you, you, you fast forward 10 years, like are we going to see more Snapchat ask tools in the workplace? Mm -hmm. I don't know. Like I like probably not, uh, but like it's, <laughs> It's like it feels a little bit like uh, mm. the prescription has been uh, uh, my generation, I guess, has kind of like uh, like continued the development of the spreadsheet and just added to that functionality rather mm. than kind of clear the decks and, and do something very, very different. As long as that's the case, then like there, there's, you know, need definitely to, to your point, Sadie, to, to, I think, get smart on that technology. And one thing that I just like was reflecting on as you were speaking is that there is this weird gap where the there is an expectation that people are good on that particular technology where they may or may not be good at it and that's i think where the issue in their lives there there lies the issue i think because uh, in the, the, uh, learning that particular technology there's abundant resources for it but you don't necessarily know that you need to be smart on uh, particular things and then the 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 kind of the other side of the equation that people just assume that you should be smart on those particular things because you grew up with technology and there's abundance of training that you're online like in all kinds of forms and so that's like yeah i agree like there, there's some there's some disconnect uh, there and and the school system seems like a, a good place to start um so yeah, yeah. And, and we also have these type of things right we have webinars and stuff like that, that where like learning like sharing of learning is actually quite interesting and i i I, I certainly join a fair few of these uh, that are unrelated to kind of my day-to-day -day particular stuff, but like are kind of more adjacently related. Uh, yeah, and I, I think from like a um, uh, sorry, Sadia, you were. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I was just going to say, from a training and development perspective, I think I I think that there's always the um, the often the expectation that people will try and do something that's that's less soft skills and more kind of like functional so this is how we can do you know a first aid course or we can do you know this uh, skills you know the typing course or something but there's kind of this nuance of you know how do we transition from using technology you know as we would use day to day in a snapchat to kind of a more work related technology and some there's some stuff softer in terms of like maybe etiquette around technology and and uh and and perhaps we kind of deprioritize that in in favor of things that are you know more you know that this is what we day to day do so we want to improve you know that i have to say i um 
<laughs> admittedly, I have a teenager who is in her GCSE um, sort of journey at the moment. And as we were looking, the school was offering um, computer courses, computer science type courses. Um, obviously, mm. to me, they're kind of a little bit alien. Um, but I was kind of trying to encourage her to look at them because I'm like, this is the future. This is where you need to go. Um, but she wasn't so keen on it, unfortunately. Um, but she does say, you know, they do try and get them to use like spreadsheets and Word documents because um, they use t her school uses Teams. Um, but she's still just like it's, it's. She doesn't. She doesn't get you know the reason why they're kind of teaching them it because mm. the fact that you come into the world and yes we all love a spreadsheet mm. um you know show me a company that doesn't have a spreadsheet um but the schools need to do a bit more real world you know application in yeah. it um to get them to understand so they do a bit of coding i believe in their it's IT class trying to get them to write little mini programs which i think is fantastic but also just the standard things that we do just day to day, just to communicate with each other, that also needs a place, I think, in the curriculum. I, I think they did realise that when obviously COVID happened, because then um, technology had to be the biggest thing to keep everyone together, to keep people, you know, educated. And I think that's where they realised that um, technology is actually important in a different aspect, to obviously, than social media. There's, there's, there's two different yeah. technologies, in my opinion. Oh. Yeah, I keep them all in a little in a little folder on my phone. So yeah, all the social stuff is just in one little place. And actually, it takes up a very small amount of the apps that I have on my phone compared to everything else. So there, it's as a teenager, that's kind of like their whole world is like social media. But actually, when you kind of get out into, I'm going to call it the real world, it's actually <laughs> there's you know there is so, there is so much so only so much social media. But then you've got to kind of get on with it. You've got to find a way to. You know, you've got to earn a living somehow. And if you can do that from social media, then good on you. But, you know, I like, um, you know, I like to go, I, d I don't mind working with other people. That's a good place to work. Job, job related technology is, is new to me because obviously I'm 19. So social media is everything still to me. Um, but I wouldn't say I'm more tech savvy than any of you guys here. I would say I'm probably actually at the bottom of it because I don't I don't know it that well. Hmm. Not, I don't know it just yet. I will know yeah. it. <laughs> So yeah, I left school at 16 and I went into doing an office job. So I've got nearly 30 years, I'm going to say, <laughs> nearly 30 years of working out and doing this. So, you know, for my skills, yes, they would, yeah, they're definitely, you know, advanced, but that's only because, yeah, as I've been using it. I had to learn it somewhere. Yeah, so, the good thing yeah. about um, my generation is that we are quick to learn. And then mm -hmm. once, once we do learn, we'll make it uh, mm -hmm. simpler for us to use. So absolutely, yes, brilliant. So I mean, I'm having. I mean, with you know, in our company, we have the IT manager who does small workshops, so people can use Word and Excel and, and Outlook and, and the things that we use in house. Obviously, we're all Microsoft based, um, and we can use them a lot easier. And he does like a little half an hour guide for us to go on and and find out how to use new products or products that we're not sure about. They're sitting on the computer and we don't know about them. <laughs> um but with our dscr as well that didn't come with a handbook because you know the guys are saying that you know it's just it's a product here it is you know trying to make it intuitive yeah. but because yeah. of the amount of people that i've had to to train to use our system i actually had to write a handbook you know yeah. because i couldn't just leave everybody to go and do what they want in it because i needed to guide them yeah. and say this is how you should do it to make sure that it's correct um so it's kind of a little bit of a yeah, double so it's like, yeah, I'd like to let people get on with it, but you do have to to take them to water sometimes. I'll stop using analogies now, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, love an, I love an analogy. Um, we've got last couple of minutes before Hemel's going to be joining us. We've got a specific question from Jackie that kind of uh, moves on from what, we're say, what we've been saying, which is uh, specifically, should we in, in social care be learning about and getting training in the, the use of the use of ai so talking about mm -hmm. potentially making things uh, simpler uh, i'll have like maybe quick 15 second take from each of you i'll kick off um I, yes is the short answer um the uh, i think like especially with regards to you don't have to understand how it works but if you understand that like in the future you'll have i think like something like a co-pilot or something like that that will assist you with get kind of uh, administrative tasks and stuff like that and re remembering things and re kind of pattern recognitions yes ai is going to change your life in that regard 
it's probably not just here yet, but it's it's edging closer quickly. Um, yeah, I, I, I agree with Oli. I, I think that um, uh, that people are going to need to kind of understand what it, what it, you know, how it works and how it can help you. And I guess there are lots of the technology that's out there is to drive efficiencies. And you know, I, I'm using I'm using it personally to drive efficiencies. And I, I think that it, it could be helpful if 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 people kind of know that as a resource, mm -hmm. like you would use Google or, or, or how it can be deployed. But I'd just say just. Uh, you know the training is going to be important because there there are limitations and uh, and and the way that it's being used in in kind of its most popular form in in the kind of generative AI, AI with kind of ChatGPT and these types of things is like what what's produced isn't always necessarily uh, you know what what's actually true is is often based on the answer that it thinks you you, you want so you've got to be I think uh, just a note of caution on that. Yeah, yeah, it's definitely it's definitely something for the future i'm, I'm not going to go yeah we'll have it tomorrow um there's obviously a lot of bugs and yeah as so robert said you need to make sure that it's going to give you the correct you know the correct answers like the correct guidance um because obviously at the moment you you're looking after people's health so um it's it's on those and i think yeah oh, it's brilliant but i've reluctance to use it for a while i believe for myself for myself i agree with you you are caring for someone's life so just check it out first and then go from there, really. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That goes, I, I agree with that. That goes to the same. Wonderful. That adds a lovely exclamation point on this uh, session. Uh, Hemel is hopefully joining us shortly. Um, while he does that, I would like to uh, just take the opportunity to thank everyone again. Firstly, all of our wonderful panelists for being so generous with their time, all of you in the audience for your comments, uh, questions, and, and for just generally being lovely as always. Um, so just to let you know what's coming up, the uh, I mentioned it at the start, but yes, we're back, we're back with, uh, with uh, Geraint at 9.30 a.m. tomorrow um, to discuss um, the, the grant funding that's available this month. And then the next one of these in our regular scheduled series of webinars will take place at 10 a.m. on Thursday, the 22nd of June. The theme is uh, data and analytics, and we'll be joined by Casey from Digital Social Care, Paul from Nourish, um, uh, Jana, who's our in-house uh, data and, and BI ex expert, and uh, a, perhaps even an extra surprise guest. So um, yeah, if uh, th thanks again for joining. And uh, if I can ask our panelists to uh, exit the stage and I'll welcome in Hamill. Thanks very much. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Hi, Evan. Can you hear me? Okay. Yeah, coming through loud and clear. Thanks, Emil. Amazing. Brilliant. Uh, good to, uh, well, not see everyone, but good to, to be here today. I am Hemel. I'm the VP of Sales here at Sona. Um, so the plan is for me to do a very quick introduction to Sona. So just a short demo of the system and how, um, yeah, how specialized we are for care, I suppose. Uh, if you have any questions or you'd like any follow-ups after this presentation, uh, please feel free to reach out to anyone on Team Sona. So let me, let's crack on because there's a fair amount to try and cover. I will share my screen. Let's share the entire screen. And then let's go to Sona. Can um, you see my screen? I think, Eamon, you may need to just give me a shout. to make Yeah, sure you're looking good here. Visible, brilliant, great. So this is Sona. Uh, essentially what we'll focus on today quickly is the, the manager portal, the admin portal, and it'll kind of cover uh, hopefully most of the aspects of Sona that make us unique. Um, so this is a view that you would access via a web page or a web browser, uh, or you can access it via a mobile device too. And this is essentially where your service managers, your regional managers, your head office teams will kind of interact with Sona to build rosters, to manage your uh, workforce and to also kind of complete and generate your payroll reports as well. Um, so as an end-to-end -end system, we do a little bit of everything. So I'll try and touch on everything as well. Let's talk about employee management to begin with. So essentially, Sona can be your single source of truth for all things uh, HR as well. As you can see, all of our different functionality is accessible via the navigation bar on the left. If I was to click into a specific team member, um, you have the ability to see your core uh, record information for your employees. Uh, we can configure fields. We have the ability to kind of create forms here as well. So you're storing the information that's most relevant to you. 
Uh, you'll also be able to track a full record of employment history, you'll be able to manage things like absence for your team members, you'll be able to track holiday leave as well. I don't know that managing holiday accrual and, and holiday leave is, is quite tricky in social care. So hopefully we can help you to simplify that. Um, we're very focused on ensuring that from a permissions perspective, uh, team members can only ever see or access things that they need to be able to see in the system, whether that's reports or the ability to approve shifts for payroll. Because uh, I know a lot of our clients come to us having used spreadsheets that can change and people can kind of paste over things, et cetera, as well. So none of that is uh, possible through the SOMA system. Uh, let's move on to the scheduling side of things. So one thing I'd highlight here as well is just how configurable SONA is as well. So we can start with a typically residential care type view of a roster. As you see, as soon as you go into a service on SONA, you can see all of your staff members. You can easily track how many contracted hours each team member is due to work. Uh, so this could be another kind of source of truth for you. You can add in running totals for number of hours worked uh, for that month, that week, if that's useful. We then have this nice traffic light system to immediately tell you your team's worked the correct number of hours or too few hours, too many hours. Um, one thing that's really kind of close to our hearts as well is the concept of open shifts. So you will see, wherever you see a Sona roster, you will see this open shift layer and you see the ability to actually post a shift that will then go out to all of your frontline staff uh, to kind of inform them that there is a shift opportunity that they, they could work. And we, we handle all the complexity around skills, making sure people have the right compliance or the right training uh, in place. And they're actually free to work the shift as well. So because we do all of that within our algorithm, it just simplifies the process of getting people to cover shifts as well. Um, the next thing I'll show is the by role view. So um, a key part of your rostering is obviously going to be validating that you actually provided the hours of support that you needed to. So we can group yourself into their relevant role types. And then we can add in things like commissioned hour targets. So you can have numbers that tell you how many care assistants you needed on a specific day and how many you had scheduled in. We could do that over a specific day period as well. So let's say you need a nurse on service every day. We can track that and help you track that as well. Um, so it's designed to be very easy to use, but also to kind of handle the complexities that you see day to day in social care. Um, if I go to the people we support, let's go to Bridge Fat Supported Living and let's go to people we support. We also have the ability, and again, depending on your service type, you could use or not use these views. That's kind of the beauty of the configuration of Sona. Uh, but here you can see if you have a supported living service with a pretty um, pretty busy range of different complex care package needs for your uh, for the people you support, your service users, um, you can see all of that is broken down in the Sona roster. So we can show you the requirements team members have, which staff members or team members will actually be providing that support uh, and we can also tag shifts against people who are being supported as well. So a good example here is you have a shared care requirement for this service user or this person you support DS, um, but uh, other service users or people you support also have a need for shared care. In Sony, you can actually link shifts to the people who require that care as well. So what that means is from an inspections perspective, you can validate and, and make sure that you can report on the number of hours of support you provided. But from a invoicing or from a payroll perspective, these shifts are only ever treated as one shift as well. We also have the ability to let you group these shifts into kind of runs of shifts as well. So essentially, if you wanted to group different visits into runs, you can do that on Sona. So you've got a really high level of configuration uh, that you can access through Sona as well. The last thing I'll quickly cover is let's go back to this view. From a time and attendance perspective, everything is done in the Sonar app via geolocation. You can see that you'll have the ability to go into shifts that have been flagged. You'll be able to process these shifts and to kind of validate whether they should be paid or to kind of adjust hours that were worked or to change the bay variant as well, if that's relevant to you. All of this can be configured and you can then approve those shifts. And if we just go to payroll to finish, so essentially, when you're ready to kind of um, create your payroll run, all of that, again, sits within the same Sona system. So we can go to create payroll run. We can choose the dates that we want to validate. So let's pick one day here. Um, and then we can go and resolve any pay queries that still need to be resolved. So I can see here, I still have one pay query that needs to be resolved before I can run my payroll for the 15th. I'll do that. 
and we're now ready to submit our payroll for the uh, your payroll report. So this could be a CSV file that's generated. It could be something that updates your dashboard. But again, everything is done in one place. And that is a very whistle-stop tour of Sona. Hopefully that was useful. Uh, and I'll hand back to Eamon. Great. Thank you so much, Hemel. Absolutely perfect lead to time. So that is ideal. And we've hit uh, two o'clock. So I will say a final farewell to everyone and hopefully see you at one of our webinars over the coming month. And do keep in touch. Thanks, everyone.